This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 84 of the Stable Scoop Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network. Barrel racing with the WPRA. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Equestrian Collections brings the whole universe of equestrian shopping to your fingertips. Visit them at equestriancollections.com. And also the Barnworks at thebarnworks.com. Welcome to the Stable Scoop, with weekly shows delivered right to you. With Helena and Glenn the Geek, live from the Stable, it's every week. They'll bring you the news through hail or hot water, while using their tails as their own fly swatters. Sit on down and laugh till your poop Cause it's time again for Stable Scoop Stable Scoop Stable Scoop Stable Scoop This is Glenn the Geek and this is Helena B., and you're listening to The Stable Scoop Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network. Catch you a little off guard with the music there, Helena? You did. <laughs> but I'm kind of digging it. Well, howdy, Helena. Howdy there, sir. Well, I'll tell you what. That's music fits our show today. Yeah, we're going Western. We're going Western. That's right. i got to let it finish here. Oh, I had an encore there. Okay. Well, this is going to be fun. I'm so looking forward to today. We, you know, we don't do enough Western stuff. No, no, we don't. And, and you know, it's so it's such a cheerful world of horsemanship. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's just so it's just so you can't help but get jacked up. I know, and I'm gonna. You know, we're talking about a, a, a we're talking about things today where they actually make money when they win, unlike the English side. Well, you know, you know what we. <laughs> We spend money, they make money. That's right. <laughs> so it's a whole different world, and we got a fun show lined up for today. We are going western with the girls of the. Women's Professional Rodeo Association today. See, I I just said WPRA in the intro. I'm I'm smart. Yes. <laughs> but it, yeah, the Women's Professional Rodeo Association. I know, and we have some great guests. We actually have three guests. We have a co uh, a third co-host. We haven't had one of those in a while. It's going to join us today, and his name is Alan Moorhead. And I've had several conversations with him now. He is one of the most famous show announcers in the Western world, and especially in the rodeo circuit. So he travels the country doing the the announcing at these shows, and I think that's cool to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, imagine not... having a job where you just get paid to talk. I know. <laughs> yeah, imagine that. Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> well, someday we'll do that. Yeah. Um, also, the past president of the Women's Professional Rodeo Association, Jimmy K. Davis. And that Jimmy is a female. I can't wait to, to talk to her. I know. And you check out her website, it's at jimmyk.com. And we'll put that link in her show notes because her name is spelled really funny. It's J Y M M Y. Um, but like a good Southern Texas girl, she has, uh, she goes by Jimmy K. So, uh, she, she'll be on the show. And then I'm very excited that we have the world champion barrel racer going to be on the show with us today too. And her name is Brittany Posey. She also has a cool website, doesn't she? Yeah, she uh, does. Yeah. yeah, I'm really, uh, these guys are pretty slick. They're, they're ahead of the game. I they think. win money. They can hire web know, developers. Right? <laughs> it all comes back to that. I know. <laughs> So Brittany's going to be with us. She's actually traveling today, so I think we're catching her in the truck on the way to a show. Cool. Uh, and she's made a few dollars, let me tell you, in the uh, barrel racing business. Uh, and she looks good doing it Look by her pictures here. So it's just going to be a fun day. We have a whole lot of Western stuff planned for you today. And, it, you know, it just, it's good to be doing Western again. It is. It is. It's putting me in the spirit. I'm actually going to look at a quarter horse this weekend. So, I'm, you know... <laughs> teach him how to do dressage but he's a quarter horse <laughs> i'm in the spirit there you go well you know it's gonna well you know he has the lope down i'm not sure if that's actually a a movement in dressage you know what i don't care what he can do as long as he's sound <laughs> yes you've looked at a lot of unsound on, horses as long as he can walk on three legs four legs four legs please, please at this point i'll take three legs i think you've looked at a hundred horses that haven't been sound i am i am going to be forever the, Did horse you have the same problem when you were looking for a husband no, no, he just fell out of the sky. Oh, and he was that. sound? That was a no brain. He was sound, <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
Well, Helena, we'll be right back in just a moment with all our fantastic guests. But first, we have to talk about equestrian collections. You know, a lot of people think about equestrian collections as only the place to get English riding apparel and attire. Well, that's not true. They also carry a bunch of Western stuff as well. Wrangler is one of their leading brands. They carry all the Wrangler products for men and women. Plus, they have complete sections now for Western riders. If you go to their website at equestriancollections.com, click on the Disciplines tab at the top of the page, and just choose Trail Riding, choose Western, and you'll find some uh, ladies' Western clothing, men's Western clothing, boots. Uh, You're going to find jewelry, Western jewelry, all kinds of uh, saddle pads and whips and crops and things like that. So you'll find it all at equestriancollections.com. So it's not only your home for English riding, it's also becoming your home for the Western lifestyle and Western attire. So check it out at equestriancollections.com and use the coupon code HORSERADIO at checkout next time you uh, shop there and you'll get $10 off your next order of $120 or more. That's Horse Radio, all one word, in the coupon code section at checkout and you'll get that discount. And thank you very much, Equestrian Collections, for your continuing support of the Stable Scoop Radio Show. So today we're going to get our first guest on with us right away. I don't see any reason to wait, do you? Nope. And his name is Alan Moorhead. He is one of, as I said, one of the most famous announcers in the horse world, in the Western horse world. He does uh, a number of different events almost every weekend, it looks like, by his schedule here. He was also the host of uh, HorseCity.com TV uh, for a number of years. He did their TV show up until last year, I believe. And, of course, HorseCity.com carries this show. So, so it's nice that we, we get to have him on today to help us out a little bit and to guide us in the world of women's rodeo and barrel racing. Because you and I, I've never barrel raced. I don't know about you. but uh, Not on purpose. <laughs> you have had a few horses, though, that uh, have taken you for a ride yeah. around a turn or two. It's um, a good thing I like speed. <laughs> <laughs> don't you think barrel racing looks like fun, though? It does. It does. I just don't know that I'd be able to. I, I, I well, we'll have to talk about this, but I, I don't know that I'd be able to stay upright. <laughs> you know those angles that they. I know they the do thought? lean at about what forty-five degrees there. I'd be eating some metal. My face would be in that barrel. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can talk to Brittany about how she stays upright, and uh, what kind of balance pills she takes before she goes out and rides. Well, let's get Alan on here and have him join us, and we'll talk a little bit about what it's like to be an announcer uh, for rodeo and western events all over the country. Well, hi, Alan, and welcome to the Stable Scoop Show. It's good to have you on today. Oh, Glenn, it's great to be on your show today. I'm, I think we're going to have a big time. Well, I think we are, too. You know, we, we enjoy doing the Western shows, and we don't get to do enough of them, so it's kind of fun for us. Well, it's going to be fun for me, too, because it's something that I get to do quite a bit. Yeah, you do. <laughs> in, one way, in one way or another. All over the country, as a matter of fact. <laughs> You're, oh, like, yeah. traveling every weekend. Tell us how you become a rodeo announcer, and you do a lot of Western shows as well. But how do you become an announcer, like one of the most famous announcers, traveling every weekend? Well, it, in my case, Glenn, Helena, it was kind of a, a backdoor deal. Uh, when I was in high school... Uh, just out of high school, always had an interest in uh, working in radio and, and uh, had some horses and stuff like that. As a matter of fact, in high school, I actually didn't have a horse. I was taking care of a friend of mine's horse who had it boarded just down the road. And uh, actually, my voice work started through uh, choirs in church and uh, sang all over the country. And at one time, uh, a group I was in from a church was asked to sing at the uh, World Baptist Youth Alliance Conference, which was in Manila, the Philippines. And uh, so got to travel out of the country and do that. And uh, all through school, uh, my teachers could all tell you that uh, somewhere down the line, I may make a living talking because I sure did enough of it in school. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm sure you got you you uh, you you got that great southern accent in church, too. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, uh, well, actually, I just think that came from mom and dad because uh, they were both from Georgia and that kind of thing, and uh, just uh, it, it's 
you get that dialect, I guess, where you, and mine probably not as strong as a lot of people's. Oh, no, uh, we don't notice it at all there, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> but I could listen to it all day. I could listen to it all day. <laughs> oh, man. Well, Helena, I mean, and, but Helena doesn't sound all that northern or nothing like that. Where, where is she? That Connecticut? or She's agnostic. I'm all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when I was, if, if you, I, I'm all over the place. I've worked kind of hard getting rid of it you know i still say coffee and when i get real mad oh there is no doubt where i come from uh, she still drives the car <laughs> to the water occasionally too well yeah. you know uh, it's... coffee <laughs> well, how do you like your coffee with cream born and in... sugar <laughs> born and raised in new york but then i moved to uh to new england as a grown-up so that uh i picked up some yankee hey, get this get this alan we're talking italian new york oh my gosh yeah yeah mm-hmm. that, oh my now you can picture it yeah, meatball sandwiches <laughs> and all those delis and things that go along with it. Oh, God, I, I love know. those New York delis. Holy I know. I, right? I mean, <laughs> they, those New York delis, now they build a sandwich that I can't even get my big mouth on. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow. I mean, they're good. I like that kind of stuff. But uh, as far as the rodeo announcing goes, uh, kind of backdoored into that because there's a place just down the road from where we live here is called the Hippodrome in uh, North oh, Augusta, yeah. South Carolina. And as they were getting that started, uh, I kind of was facility manager for it and uh, had booked a Palomino horse show. And with the Palomino show coming in, was talking to the guy from Columbia, South Carolina, who was uh, going to be the show manager and basically the producer. And Oh, like three days before the show, he's having a visit down there to get stuff set up, and he receives a call on his cell phone that uh, his announcer can't come. And, you know, through conversations that you'll have with people, he knew I worked in radio and uh, had horses, and we showed horses, my wife and I, and he asked if I could possibly announce his horse show for him that weekend. I said, well, sure, you know, i got to be here anyway, uh, running the facility. And as it did, you know, went on with it, and right when it was over with, he wrote me a check. Can you believe that? <laughs> I know in the horse world, get paid. Yeah, and and I mean, you know, it, it, it's kind of cool that with my history of of talking in school, anytime I receive something written from the teacher, it wasn't a check. I can promise you that. <laughs> and uh, when I had to cash what was written at school at home, it hurt. <laughs> And uh, but anyway, I mean, it, it just kind of grew from there where we were showing and. Uh, uh, swapping off entry fees and things like that. And I had always been a rodeo fan. Uh, never did any eventing in rodeo other than some high school rodeo that we were going to try to do. And uh, Well, what kind of showing a, did uh, you do there, Alan? Uh, well, all-around type deals. Halter, Pleasure. My wife had a couple of all-around horses and uh, and that type of thing. All I've ever done is break horses for, for people to, to show. I have never been in a show pen myself. Uh, they have done some jackpot, not jackpot ropings, but some just practice ropings and things like that around here. I like to rope a little bit, but just don't have a whole lot of chance to do it. Uh, but my favorite thing has always been uh, taking the two-year-olds, you know, getting them broke, riding started, good ranch broke, and then uh, selling them, watching them going down the road with somebody else to finish them for going into show pen and things like that. Uh, my wife has several good barrel horses right now. She does a lot of barrel racing. Uh, rodeo and National Barrel Horse Association type deals. Uh, both of our kids have come up on the back of horses. Uh, my oldest is 21 now, getting ready to graduate college, and uh, my youngest is 17 and uh, junior in high school. And, and they've had some things that uh, they've gotten involved with through school musically, uh, through band and things like that, that uh, have kind of taken them off the horses for a while when they're focused on school and, and getting through college and that. But, uh, you know, they still do well. But uh, it just came from from a love of the sport. And I can remember when I was a kid in school, uh, you know, watching the NFR on television uh, and then the next day going out and uh, riding that buddy of mine's horse that I was taking care of. And uh, it just as as I went through getting started with announcing the quarter horse shows, the paint horse shows, uh, it just fell into where – I wanted to go and announce some of the things that I've watched all my life coming up with the, the rodeo deals. And you sure so what, do. You travel the country. Yeah, yeah, but where do you where do you announce the most? Like, what what would you consider your your sort of foundation uh, gig? Uh, well, basically, I, I do several things a year for the National Barrel Horse Association. 
uh, that was probably uh, a kickstart into the rodeo industry for me because I put a lot of rodeo style uh, announcing into the, the barrel races. It kind of broke up the boredom. It used to be you went to barrel races and you'd hear uh, announcers just call a name and a number and a horse's name every now and then if they happen to have it written down. <laughs> and uh, I got it started with doing some things as far as playing some music, uh, a lot of the sponsor stuff, you know, just like we'd do at a rodeo. And then some rodeo producers had heard me, and we just started working some things to go into them rodeos. And uh, I went to uh, Zoop Dove, S.J. Dove, lives in uh, Farmington, New Mexico. He's announced at the Wrangler National Finals Rodeo twice. And and he had a uh, rodeo announcement school, and I went to it before every he even stepped up to do a rodeo. And uh, uh, Lord, it's paid off because it gave me a lot, of, uh, gave me a lot of background into the industry and uh, and the ins and outs of the mechanics of actually carrying a rodeo from start to finish. Because there, there's a lot of responsibility on an announcer to kind of keep things going smooth along. Well, and, you have to uh, think on your feet. I mean, you're you're doing improv a lot, basically, throughout the show. Oh yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. It, it's from one thing to the other, and it's uh, it's the ability. I mean, in, in transitionalizing and you know making those transitions. Uh, yeah, we're it, so good at those, aren't we, Helena? I'm transitions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There is no transition that I'm good at ever. <laughs> Upward, downward, segways. No. <laughs> She oh, she does I, I excellent transitions in the dressage ring. She can do yeah. that. But no, I can't. I can't. <laughs> and in the stable scoop, I was listening to some of the shows the other day on the internet. I think one of my favorite transitions was one of your Valentine's Day deals. Where, oh no! Uh, <laughs> where the geek started off with some. Oh God! I mean, it was almost a horribly uh, 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 such as it was too soothing. The song that he started with. Oh yes. <laughs> Alina was just on you about how sappy you were. I know. But not on. Man, I said, holy cow. <laughs> I said, man. I, now, I would have expected that song from Helena, but where did it come from? But, and I can't even remember what it was, but holy. You know. I try and shock Helena with things occasionally. Um, yeah, like I played some really Western music. I shocked her at the beginning of this show, actually, with I threw a Western song in she wasn't counting on, and... Uh, uh, I think that but it got me all geared up. Yeah, it did. It got her. She put on her hat and her cowboy boots and her belt buckle. She's ready. Uh, you know what? Yeah. This is, is I and Alan. I know nothing about Western riding. I know what um, some tack looks like. <laughs> I know quarter horses are big in the Western world. I, I know what a barrel looks like. So that that's about it. So I really have nothing witty to say. But what you'll find, I think, <laughs> in in my participation in any Western podcast is silence because I'll probably get caught up in listening so much that I forget to ask questions. Well, that's why we have Alan here. He actually knows what questions to ask. <laughs> so. oh, that could be dangerous. That could but, be dangerous. No, really, it, it's such a it's such a big world. It's such um, a, an exciting part of horses that um, that I think a lot of English riders don't um, they they don't get excited about it because they don't understand it. So it's kind of like people who, who watch dressage. If you don't know what you're looking at, you know, it's kind of like watching paint dry. Right. A Western, though, I think it's, it's a little bit more attractive than that. You, it's, it's more obvious what you're looking at. But if you really understand what's going on behind the scenes, I think it, it could really be exciting for the English rider. So I'm, I'm really excited to have you on to, to learn through your eyes because I'm sure you see a whole lot at, you know, at these events. So I think um, I, I'm particularly excited about learning about the Western world through, through your eyes and your perspective. Oh, I'm excited that you're excited. So, so basically, your background is mostly English, then to dressage and jumping and such as that. Then, Helena. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. Well, and it, 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 it's the kind of a thing too that that we in the Western world uh, we look kind of in awe sometimes at the English riders and and how fluid the motion is and how how you barely even notice the transitions in the diagonals when you're talking about the. Uh, the dressage and such as that and, and how smooth it can look and, and just how you can tell the difference in uh, one of the top rank riders and one of those coming along where the smoothness is not there. And a lot of times in training and in giving lessons to someone who wants to ride Western Helena, this you'll find this interesting is uh, to for balance and, uh, and that type of thing in riding, 
Mm-hmm. We'll tell folks to go take a couple of weeks of uh, English riding lessons. You learn how to ride on one of them little you know, English saddles. Um, <laughs> it's just going to make it that much easier if you've got a little English balance behind you before you get into Western. Yeah, that you know, I, quite a bit. I love that. And that's one of the reasons why I'm excited that um, we're looking at bringing some Western shows onto the network, because I, so I think so many times or maybe too often um, when you've got different disciplines, a lot of people will point out the differences or, oh, you know, those Western people do that and that's they do that different and I don't understand it, so therefore I don't like it. And then, you know, the other way around, Western folks kind of look at the English writers. But I think that which unites us is greater than that which divides us. And the amount of training, the amount of discipline that goes into whatever sport you ride, I think commands a mutual respect from the English world and the um and the Western world. And I would like to see more, I guess I, I'm equally excited for the opportunity to talk about those things that unite us, that we can share from one another. Oh, and it's like I said, there's so many, there's so many differences that are similar. Right. <laughs> exactly. Study, Thank you. <laughs> if You're you hired. study it closely, I mean, like uh, I've watched and, and I'll utilize some of the things that I've seen. Uh, and I've been fortunate enough to, uh, with with going to the American Quarter Horse shows and the American Paint Horse shows where they have the all arounds and there's some English, and uh, through the television show I used to do uh, on HorseCity.com TV, uh, where we did some things with some English and Olympic riders and that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just a matter of uh, the how you use your legs, you know, hand positioning and such as that to to coincide with uh, how the horse is made and using his mechanics to make him, you know, work right as opposed to just sitting down and taking a hold of the reins and, you know, getting a hold of the mouth and trying to make them do. Uh, if you can just find the balance there and, and, and use some of everything that you see, there's always something to learn from uh, in any aspect that you look at. Now, I Alan, uh, this show, we, we wanted to concentrate on the uh, Women's Professional Rodeo Association. Now, you work, I, I'm looking at your schedule here, and you have quite a few shows you do for them. Oh, yes, sir, I do. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've been fortunate uh, uh, that for the last four years running, I've been uh, selected to announce the Women's World Finals Rodeo. Um, well, actually, five years. It's three years in uh, Alvarado, Texas, and then two years in... Uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's going to move this year to Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, it's going to move up to October, and uh, I haven't heard anything about selections yet, but if not, I understand. Um, but it, it's a great association, and, and uh, also tickled to have been selected for 2008 and 2009 as the Women's Professional Rodeo Association announcer of the year. Quite an honor. Shared that wow. last year. They actually had co announcers of the year. Uh, with myself and Tim Fuller, the fellow from Oklahoma, and he and I announced the uh, the National High School Rodeo Finals together last year in uh, Farmington, New Mexico, and this year we've both been selected again to announce the high school finals in uh, Gillette, Wyoming, in, in July, and I just feel that that's quite an honor when you look at some of the names that uh, that are in the nominations and in the field for announcer of year, and, and then to have the votes from the, from the ladies to be representing them as announcer years is well. That's good. Well, congratulations there, Alan. Really? Oh, thank yeah. you. Well done. <laughs> every every guy wishes to be voted for by the ladies and win. I mean, that's <laughs> that's that's just great. Uh, yeah. And you know what? Yeah. If you're going to announce for the women and the men, pick the women. I mean, you took the right course there. Oh, well, you are such a geek. Right. I mean, I can tell you what. The scenery is always. Yeah, good. I know. That's what I was just saying. Uh, you know, and, loose uh, loose jeans have not come into style yet. <laughs> oh, thank the Lord for that. Oh, yeah, man. We're like feed packs walking around or something like that. But, uh, well, let's get... And, and it's the, Go ahead. It's the WPRA as well. Now, they're over 50 years in existence. They're working on 52 years now. And uh, w- one of the recognizable things for your listeners when we talk about the Women's Professional Rodeo Association if any time in the first week of December over the last several years they have sat down in front of a television on ESPN and ESPN2 and watched any of the uh, national finals rodeo competition, the barrel racing that they have at the PRC, Professional Rodeo Cowboy Association Rodeo, is 
sanctioned by the WPRA, the Women's Professional Rodeo Association, through a uh, partnership that they have. And so that is the recognition that, that your listeners could uh, uh, coincide with as far as what we're talking about when we talk about the WPRA. And it's a little deeper than that, and we'll get into some of that here in a little bit. But uh, uh, back in 1948, there were a couple ladies, uh, Fina May Farr and uh, a lady by the name of Nancy Benford, uh, who, uh, I mean, true cowgirls, they, they could barrel race, they could rope, and, and there's a lot of ladies that can rope, and I, I would just about, there's several, but I would just about match up with uh, with some of the guys most anywhere in the country. And uh, But anyway, it's been a long, hard fight for them, uh, and one thing that basically got the girls thinking they could do it was, uh, it was a wartime effort, you know, back during World War II when all the guys were gone, and so much responsibility were put on the ladies of America, uh, not only to keep business going, the households going, and such as that, while all the guys were off at war, uh, some of the entertainment befell the women as well. And so uh, with all the guys gone, there was no male rodeo, and, and the girls got together and uh, had some women's rodeos and things like that. And well, uh, I didn't know that. Huh. From there, it has grown. And, you know, I guess you, you think about it during that time, the horses still had to be worked. I mean, they were oh, sitting yeah. around doing nothing. Um, oh, yeah, exactly yeah. right. Well, well thank God for the right. war. What are you going to say that? that. Say that. <laughs> no, seriously. I She's mean, getting I, us back for the jeans comment, I think. Totally, <laughs> totally. You're getting paid for that for the next three shows. You, but no, really, the, uh, the women really came to the forefront when uh, when all the men went off to war. And, and it's right. not just horses that, uh, you know, we we actually had to step up to the plate in a lot of areas and and proved our our worth our worthiness there um oh, and it's Lord, nice I mean, and, and it's even deeper than that helena because they went to the factories and they were building tanks they were building guns they were building jeeps uh for the war effort and and i mean you know it's just uh it, where would we be if it wouldn't have been for the women <laughs> yeah <laughs> i wouldn't be here i know that um so so let's get what let's get a woman on here uh we have the past president uh four-year president of the women's professional rodeo association i'll let you just introduce her she's jimmy k davis oh jimmy k davis i'll tell you what she's quite a lady she's had a couple of terms as president of the wpra uh, she has represented the sport uh, to the circuit finals, Texas circuit finals. Uh, she has also been a qualifier to the Women's World Finals Rodeo and, uh, and is exemplary to the talent of a woman who not only barrel races but ropes. She's qualified in the roping to the Women's World Finals Rodeo. And, and, and I'm always proud to introduce her as a great competitor and a finalist uh, at any rodeo you go to, but uh, I'm more proud that she's my friend, Jimmy K. Davis. Well, hey, Jimmy, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm good, me amigo. How are you? Oh, man, I'm almost perfect, but I get more perfect any time I hear your voice. You know that. Oh, you you are so overflowed. <laughs> but I, I love that about you. I love that about you. No, it's my pleasure. I'm excited to be on the show today. He said the same thing to me, Jimmy. Oh, oh. See, you, know, you can't believe a word. You got the black hat. Don't well, then how come you never call me me amigo? You don't have like terms of endearment I for me. No, I need to come up with these little s- sayings for you, I guess. Oh, she, well, then again, if I had Jimmy K's record, <laughs> she would be me amiga. Oh, me amiga? Yeah, amiga. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. The, the okay. uh in Spanish is, is a little feminine there, you know. Okay. Yeah, yeah. when that's the extent of my Spanish is, um, my friend, where's the bathroom and I need another beer? <laughs> <laughs> It's about the, my extent of English. Jimmy um, K, you're invited over for dinner. Come on but, up. Yeah, but, but you All notice right, thank you. You, you notice that the cowgirl comes out right there, the cowboy and cowgirl mentality. It's, it's not the fact of I want or I'd like to have it. I need another beer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Necesito, por favor. There's yes. no drinking at these Western shows, is there? Oh, heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there is, there is, there is a little bit. Well, well that's what I was bit. just trying to rack my brain is figuring out what an amigo or amiga would be in in the English terminology. I don't know. Friend, uh, friend. friend is a friend. Yes. Yeah, my friend. Okay. My friend. Yeah, my well, saddle we're, pal. We're counting on Helena for that one. My friend. Yeah. Yeah. My friend. Yeah. Yes, my friend. Well, that but, works. Yeah, if it's a boy, then it's what? What is it, me amigo? And if it's a uh, girl, and, uh, yeah. And if it's my, my, my friend, yeah, my lady friend. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, and, and, you know, we're talking about the, the Western world. And, Jimmy K., we've been talking about the WPRA that, that is now celebrated over 
you know, 51 years, working on 52 years of existence. And and uh, you had an opportunity to sit as president of the WPRA, and, and you as well as a competitor. Talk a little bit about some of the responsibilities that, that a president of a big association like that has and maybe some of the uh, things that she has to deal with. Well, you know, that was that was one of the great blessings of my life, Alan, as you know. Uh, it was It's an elected position. And uh, I got the opportunity to sit at the head of that association. I served as Texas director for a couple of years because that's the circuit that I'm from. There's 12 circuits across the, the nation and then another circuit within our association for what we call our roping and riding division. Uh, the 12 circuits are mainly the barrel racers broken down into different regions, just like the Cowboys are. Right. Um, and uh, so I was Texas director for a while, and then I was vice president and then president. And basically I... I uh, worked with the office in the day-to-day business and running of the association. I talked to a lot of the sponsors. We have some great sponsors in our rodeo industry. And um, talked to a lot of the committees. The committees that put on rodeos across America are just the best, most wonderful people. Most of them are, are volunteers. Some of the bigger rodeos like Houston, Denver, San Antonio, they have committees that are, uh, you know, they're, they're more of a paid thing because they're, they're bigger, and they get all these scholarships for kids and things like that. But they're the finest, most hardworking, down-to-earth people you've ever worked with, as are the women in our association. Oh, exactly right. And and well, and you talked about the the twelve circuits and uh, and being the presiding member of the WPRA over those twelve. But each circuit, and you mentioned that you were Texas circuit director. Uh, talk just a little bit about the support that you got from all of the the circuit directors as being president of the WPRA. Oh, gosh, it's, you have to have that. The, the WPRA, as you probably already talked about, is the oldest uh, women's organized sporting association in the world. It's even older than the LPGA. Um, and the unique thing about our association is that it is it's truly run by, by all women, a president, a vice president, and the board of directors. And they meet uh, usually three times annually, and then they are constantly on the phone with conference calls and emails. And they make all of the decisions together, whether it's as a board or they. some of the smaller decisions, they, they break up into committees. But all of those women have to work together to make the decisions for the future and, and the benefits of our members in this association. And they're, they're, they do it for nominal pay, and they're very dedicated. It's just, it was amazing to work with them. And Jimmy, and, can, yeah, go ahead. Go do, ahead. What do you, um, you, you, what are the, what are the, what, what is the WPRA doing well these days? And what are the challenges of the organization? What have you mastered so far? And then what are you looking to achieve at going forward or that organization? Uh, have y'all, have y'all talked about how it was started and all that? Yeah, we did. Have yep. You, yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Well, that, the goal as that you've already touched on was to, to provide an association that looked out for the interest of, of the cowgirls in the professional rodeo arena. And that is something that they have, they have done. And it's always a work in progress as any, you know, any other challenge in this world. But uh, we have gone from our original, what was it, 70, 74 members to, um, you know, over 2,000. And um, hopefully we have given them a voice in the rodeo arena with equal pay and better ground conditions for their horse. Something else we've done in the last few years is we've created a junior division. It's kind of a a grassroots uh, reach out to to bring the young women into our association to umbrella them and to help them run with the big girls and get a taste of professional rodeos. So hopefully if if that's something that interests them in their future, then they've got kind of a foot in the door with that. And And the the juniors that she's talking about, uh, Glenn and Helena, are are kids that are high school age. They they can be 17 and under. And uh, we've had them show up at the finals that were 12 and 14, and I mean really talented on the horses. And and uh, I was tickled to see the WPRA step up as that and uh, got so excited about it that, that I volunteered to sponsor the World Championship Buckle for the juniors And uh, because they, they, they're they not only the future of rodeo, uh, they're the future of America, and we've got to do what we can to help develop their character, I feel like. Sorry to well, that's didn't a- interrupt you. That's what it sounds. It sounds like that that, that um, the women's professional rodeo is actually a, a goal in itself for these young girls. It, 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 so, exactly. Right. It, exactly. And and we've always considered ourselves the elite because that's where you know your top professional women rodeo athletes compete. But you have to have a, a some sort of path 
bring these young competitors in, you know, to not only give them a place to compete, but also ensure the the longevity of your association. And, uh, and and these young girls are they are so fun to watch, and they work hard, and they're usually there with their parents and their family, and the crowd goes crazy. You know, they they're just they are absolutely they they never go on stage with an animal or a kid, but you try to compete at a rodeo with a kid on an animal, and you're you're out of luck. <laughs> because they just bring them to their feet. And the other thing that we've done as an association is uh, we we started programs for our young horses. It's a security and derby division for our young horses because horses are just like the kids. You know, you have to start them out, and you don't want to throw them to the wolves when they're four years old running against these seasoned competitive equine athletes. So we've developed programs to season our young horses, too. So it, we're, we've got some great programs going on, and I'm really excited about the future of our association. And, and you're talking about the future of rodeo as far as the four-legged athletes, the horses. Uh, one of the interesting notes that, that really proves that the Futurity and Derby program is working is the fact that uh, Brittany Posey, last year's world champion at the NFR, rode, yeah, he's firing Duke, which is a, a, a five-year-old horse, I believe, who was through the Futurity and Derby program. And, uh, I mean, it's just amazing to watch this horse go out there at such a young age and compete against some of those 12- and 13- and 14-year-olds and, and just, you know, do what he did to help Brittany win that world title last year. And we'll have Brittany on here in just a minute. I wanted to mention that. Oh, God, that's cool. Yep, uh, Brittany <laughs> Posey will be on with us in just a minute. Hey, I do have a question for you there, Jimmy Kay. I was uh, looking at your website, and you had the opportunity to do something really cool in 2009. Tell us about that. Oh, you're talking about when I went to Afghanistan. Yeah, I saw the pictures of you all decked out with the machine gun and looking all looking all hard ass. <laughs> yeah, let me let me tell you, they I taught that uh, several of us. It was Liz Pinkston, who is a former NFR uh, average winner, and Tater Porter from the PDR, and Dan Mortensen, and uh, Jesse Jesse Davis from the PRC. We all went on behalf of Pro Rodeo for a, like a goodwill tour to visit the troops in Afghanistan. And it was the most unbelievable thing that I've probably ever done. And I met the most fascinating, wonderful men and women that serve our country. And um, you, saw the, you saw the pictures on there. We went to a, a base in Goshta, and they let us do some firearm things. And uh, I'm not very good with a grenade launcher, and I'm so so <laughs> with a 9 millimeter. But I'm going to tell you what, with an M240 Bravo, I can get it on. But I'll tell you what, girlfriend, you're looking pretty good in that camo. <laughs> yeah, I was, well, yeah, everybody looks good in camo. <laughs> but it we was, had a ball. To, to go there ball. to inspire and then come home being inspired yourself, yeah? Oh, there was, you know, that's what's so funny. You go there to inspire, and... I don't know how much we inspired at all, but we just, our jaws dropped everywhere that we went. The the things that our men and women in our arms are getting done over there that you really don't hear about on the media. You know, you hear all the bad stuff. You don't hear that uh, that now little girls get to go to school over there, you know, that the infant mortality rate was one of the highest in the world, and that's been decreased by, by you know, like 50%. You know, you don't hear about those kind of things that, that our soldiers do over there. And people have asked me when I went, you know, people were afraid for me to go over there. And they asked when I got there if I was scared. And I said, I'm going to tell you what, you get there and you meet these men and women and you see how they work over there and there is no fear. You 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 look over the, the mountain into Pakistan and, and you think, you know what, I, I dare you to come over that mountain. Because yeah. these, the American soldiers are the baddest of the bad. And That's it's awesome. just the most amazing patriotic feeling, and you just say, say thank you, God, for our country and those who defend us. And you are cozying up to a few of them in these pictures, I'm noticing, too. <laughs> well, you can, you know, a girl's got to do what a girl's got to do. <laughs> you know She's what? just trying to stay safe, you know, protect her assets. <laughs> I'm telling you, yeah, a girl's got to do what a girl's got to do. And when you're in enemy territory, you got to stay close to the big guns. Like <laughs> I love the one picture of the uh, guys with the super muscles and uh, the two of you. That's pretty good. Those, those are the firefighters in Bagram. And as a matter of fact, I, I still email a couple of them, you know, to stay in touch. And they lost a, a member of their team day before yesterday, a rocket wow. to the village that they're staying in, hit a hut. And uh-huh. uh, I got I got news of that. And so my heart and, and my prayers go out to his family and friends. But those those guys, uh, 
are amazing. And the, and the women over there, they're just everyone. You just walk around in awe. It was a fascinating trip. Fascinating. Well, I'd love to go again. And that's really neat. I think that's also something that you see, you actually do see more of uh, in the Western side in, in rodeo and those kinds of things, these outreach programs that, that you don't necessarily see in, in some of the other disciplines. And I think it's fantastic. And, and this is what America's all about here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you bet. You bet. You know, there was when we went over there, I, I, I sang the national anthem at the National Finals Rodeo, which was a thrill. But Is that when you were in the there. black outfit there in the... In the turquoise? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 And, but... Um, She's at home in the spotlight. There, yeah, I yeah. see that. <laughs> a girl's got to do what a girl's got to do, Alan. Yeah. <laughs> and you do it very well. <laughs> Oh, thank you. But, but when I got to sing it with the, you know, for our military there, you know, and there were, and it wasn't just our military. There were, there were, uh, there were soldiers there from, from Britain and from Egypt and from France and from all these other places. And when I got to stand it and sing our national anthem, it was pretty, it was, it was pretty chilling. You know, it was just phenomenal. So my hats off to all of our military. I'm pretty flag waving patriotic though. Well, that's that's and I know yeah. Alan is too. Well, and thank you on our behalf for going over there and and bringing such love to those guys, those men and women. I, and I you mean, know, she and Liz represented not only the WPRA but but rodeo as a whole, and and anybody that throws a leg across a western saddle, uh, it's a, it's even extended further than that when we're talking about the guys and gals of the military who wear the uniform of the armed services, and and when you talk about patriotism. Whether it's a WPRA rodeo, a PRCA rodeo, an IPRA rodeo, uh, even at the regional rodeo level, there is not a rodeo today that will start a performance without a tribute in some kind of way to the colors that never run the red, white, and blue of this country and the men and women who keep her free. And uh, I'm just tickled to be a part of an industry who, who takes to heart so much the pride of freedom in America. You know that 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 actually I'm I get this sense that there there is a it's a huge sense of community within the Western world, um, both for our country and then as you dive down and go deeper and deeper into the local level, you still have that sense of support from one another. Do you find that that really is pervasive throughout the Western disciplines and the competitive absolutely. world? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, uh, Alan was talking a while ago about the NFR. I mean, this year. Uh, Tammy Fisher is a, a prime example. She she lost her son in an automobile accident um, yep. back in June, June 27th. Mm-hmm. Right after that, she won Calgary. She won the $100,000 in Calgary um, and qualified with all of her other winnings to the national finals this year. And her good horse got crippled. Uh, nothing serious, but she didn't want to run him at the NFR, didn't want to hurt him. So she took her young horse, and uh, he wasn't quite seasoned and wasn't quite ready for the NFR. Um so Terry Servey, who was a, a good friend of hers, but also a fellow competitor who won the average this, there this year, offered her uh, one of her, actually her stallion, and, and she made a run on him there. And you don't see that in every discipline, and you certainly don't see that in every sport. You know, you can go to a rodeo and you watch the bulldoggers, and they'll, they'll bulldog a steer, and then they'll get off of that horse and get on the hazing horse to haze for their buddy. And if they do their job right, they're going to get beat. Their buddy's <laughs> going to out, you know, it's going to outdo them. But that's just kind of the cowboy and cowgirl way is you do the best you can and you darn sure help your, you know, your friends and your competitors to do the best they can because you're not the best until you've beaten the best at their best. And, you know, Helena, one thing that I think is unique to our part uh, of the world, and, and I'm sure to an extent it, it's even in, in the English shows and such as that, but in, in our part of the world, in, in the Western just like uh, Jimmy K said, I mean, uh, P.J. Berger had to borrow a horse to go out. She had one taken out from under, and uh, Jana Jaro, uh, cowgirl from uh, Louisiana, let her borrow one that uh, uh, P.J. had been on before. Uh, and, and I know that, that uh, Tammy Fisher had another one that she borrowed from uh, Nancy Adkins in Ohio, uh, just in case something didn't work out with the other one. And, and that horse had won a Barrel Futurities of America World Championship. But there's such a, a, a family closeness in rodeo and throughout the Western events. that uh, and, and, and just to give you a little light on it, uh, and I know Jimmy K is the same way I am, uh, folks will say, well, gosh, you know, you, you, sometimes you spend three, four, five, six weeks on the road before you get home. And, and yes, I mean, my heart misses my wife and it misses my kids and, and being able to see them, the cell phone keeps us in touch. But there's nowhere that I can go when I'm at an event and not 
feel like I'm truly around family. Somebody's got my back, lift my spirits, and, and should anything happen, go wrong, they're there for me, uh, and vice versa, something happens. I mean, we just lift each other up, and, and uh, that's what it takes to get down the road and rodeo when there's so many miles. Hmm. You bet. I think Trevor is the best. Uh, you can probably pick a, a lot better way to make a living, but probably not any better way to make a life. Oh, yep. Absolutely. Well, and do you see is and we're going to have to wrap it up, unfortunately, with Jimmy K already. Uh, time's just running out. But do you see Jimmy K that the that the membership is increasing and that there are more and more girls getting into rodeo and, and the Western disciplines? You know, I see the the membership increasing. Unfortunately, the the economy, the recession that we've had, has you know, affected everyone. And certainly when you're running up and down the road with diesel and high dollar trucks and trailers and horses, if, you know, especially if you're not in the top echelon that's that's winning the most money, that's going to slow you down some. But that's exactly why the WPRA reached out and and developed the programs that we've got now to include more people uh, such as our youth and people who are, are staying home more and just seasoning young horses. Because, you know, at the end of the day, You've got to increase your association, your numbers, you know, and that's that's what it's all about. It's an association made for to serve the members of our association, and you have to give them something to to, uh, to participate in. So that's something that the WPRA has worked very hard in doing. Well, you have and something. By virtue, yeah. And by virtue of building the association by membership, just just to give you a little bit of, like Jimmy says, there was like maybe 60 members. Before, well, there was 30 some odd members. Uh, there was 60 events the first year they had it in 1948, uh, some 50 years ago, and the total purse, the total payout over those 60 events was 29,000. Right now, at the NFR, in one run, a girl can win almost 15,000. <laughs> Sid, I'm trading in my tack. Yeah, you give the wrong. You <laughs> so need we're, a horn. We're talking about all those members running in 48 and 60 events to pay 29,000. Of course. The 1948 dollar was not what the 2010 dollar is. I mean, you know. Oh, I, uh, I, I know a few English riders would love to win the uh, 29,000. <laughs> I could tell you that. Right. Well, you have to understand too, though. Back in 19 in 1948, the even though the purse was lower for gosh, it was lower for everyone for people playing golf or tennis or anything else. But the thing of it was that was prevalent then is that the men had the opportunity to win more money than the women did yeah. in any given sport, and it took. Whatever sport you're talking about, whether it be tennis or golf or rodeo, it took the women standing up to say, you know what, uh, we're not going to do this for less money than than everyone else does. We're, you know, we don't, we don't, we're not any better. We don't need any more. But we, by golly, sure need the same thing everybody else gets, and that's that's what's made the difference for for women, you know, in in every sport in every discipline of of um, of our industry is equality. Well, Jimmy K., we appreciate you being on. We've just run out of time here. Uh, we, you know, we'll definitely have you back on. It's just been, this has been a whole lot of fun. <laughs> and now we have to get Brittany on. And, you know, she's, Pat, what, the world, current reigning world champion, right? She, she is. She yeah, is. well, this she's should be. She's got a bunch f- of great horses and, and world champion. And uh, you'll enjoy talking to her. And Glenn, Helena, and, and Alan, mi amigo, it was great. And thank you so much for having me on. Well, Glenn, Helena, I tell you, you talk about the great ones, and we're talking about the Western events and, of course, the WPRA and barrel racing. Uh, we welcome now a two-time world champion, WPRA Cowgirl. She's twice won the average at the Wrangler National Finals Rodeo, and she's got some of the most outstanding horses you'll ever watch around. Three cans. How about would you make welcome uh, Brittany Posey, Victoria, Texas. Brittany, how are you doing today? I'm good. Well, where are you at today? Well, uh... I'm going to Mercedes, Texas this morning, and I'm actually headed to Houston to the semifinals. Oh, the semis and then to Houston, yeah, the finals this week and uh, the big $50,000 paycheck there. Uh, how do you feel about your chances going into that? Uh, I feel really good. Um, I was in the first group in uh, the, the qualifying rounds, and I won 9,500. I was only 500 short of winning, winning it straight across, and uh, I... My time is two tenths faster than what anybody's run so far, so I'm I'm ready. Well, Brittany, this last weekend I saw you in Jacksonville, Florida, and it was a, a National Barrel Horse Association deal, and, and Stitch 
looked awful good uh, Saturday in that big open race, placed in the top five there. Uh, your young horse, uh, French Cover Girl, is looking really good. Uh, talk about French Cover Girl and Dude. Uh, yeah, he's firing and, and, and what they've meant to, uh, especially last year's world championship with Dude. Well, um, Duke, Duke has definitely been uh, a instrumental part in, uh, you know, helping me win as much as I've won this year. And also, in uh, what I won last year, uh, he uh, came up to security ranks with Latricia Duke, and uh, hence the name Duke. And uh, I bought him about March of his uh, four-year-old year. And he's had a few um, soundness issues here and there, but... Um, First six-year-old, and, you know, he has just come on strong. I couldn't ask for him to do any better. And uh, French Cover Girl, I actually purchased her off the Internet as a two-year-old and uh, trained and procured her myself. And tell us, tell us for the English side of our audience, you're, uh, we're assuming you're riding quarter horses here. Yes, they're all, um, all three of my, well, actually everything I own is, is a quarter horse, registered quarter horse. Okay. And now nope. you, the difference, you know, it's funny at the beginning of that conversation, you talked about the money side. I mean, that is a big difference between the English side and the, what you're doing is you actually have the opportunity to make some of your money back. You're not just winning ribbons. Right. Uh, you definitely have to win. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, that is a little thing. That's a- yeah, yeah, but uh, for sure, it, it is It is nice to, you know, be able to pay your expenses and have, you know, if you win quite a bit, then, you know, you can have some nice things and try to make a living out of it. And the other thing that makes the English side really jealous, because I've been to a Quarter Horse Congress a few times, is you guys have the best rigs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they come with a nice price tag as well. <laughs> well, they're covering a lot of ground, too. You know, when you're out in the middle of the United States, it's, uh, well, let's say you, you were in Mercedes, Texas, and you're now headed to where? Houston, you said? Yes, yes. Okay, so how far of a, a trip is that for you? It's about a five-hour drive. Yeah, okay. So, you know, these guys are covering a lot of territory. You, you need to have a nice ride. That's true. Okay. But let's talk about sure. this a few weeks ago, uh, and Brittany will remember this. We were in Kinder, Louisiana, and it was another barrel futurity. And, and like when you look at the WPRA standings and you see that last year Brittany earned 155800 on the year going into the NFR, another $100,000 at the NFR. Uh, so she's over 250000 last year, is one over a million. But it, it comes at, at a cost of miles. Uh, Kinder, Louisiana is right after San Antonio or during San Antonio. Uh, and Brittany was then running futurity horses, going to Jackson, Mississippi, and off to another rodeo. Uh, tell them, Brittany, how you have to plan all this kind of stuff, and sometimes getting somebody else to haul a horse, leave a horse to somewhere else. Uh, I know you had uh, you had Stitch down in the States this year, and Duke up north in Canada. Talk about some of the logistics that you have to do, and and, and sometimes just flying to rodeos. Yeah. Um... Well, there is. A, if you wanna, if you wanna do everything, which I've been trying to do the maturity horses and the rodeos, and first of all, you have to be really nice to Procom, and they've got to, te- they kind of get you upright. Uh, you've got to have a little luck involved. And um, uh, this year, I've done a lot of flying um, back and forth places just to get to the rodeos, um, and I have, you know, a great team of people that help me get horses here and there and you know i have three different rigs that that go places um we actually kinder we had 12 horses there we took two rigs to the the security and uh, last year rodeo and i had some friends up in canada where duke stayed there all the time and stitch stayed down in the states and i flew back and forth so it is it it, it just depends on how hard you want to go if you want to go really hard you can go really hard if you have two good horses if you don't i mean you can kind of cruise through and uh you know maybe not maybe not go on the nfr in first place but you know make the finals and be comfortable and uh, i mean there's a lot of girls that just have one horse what do, what do y'all look at now as, as when the girls are out there hauling from rodeo to rodeo, and and then you have the NFR in sight, and uh, say like Houston has the fifty thousand dollar bonus, which for this year, I mean you're leading it with just over fifty thousand, it's going to give you a hundred thousand. What is the break point to where with the money that you can earn in Vegas that you think you can go into maybe eighth, ninth, and still have a chance at winning the world? Well, kind of the rule of thumb is. 
after the 4th of July, you can double uh, 15, and that's how much it's going to take. Um, but pretty much if you have, you know, 65000 or above before, uh, before Vegas, then that's pretty much kind of the cutoff point. That's what everybody says. Oh, I need to have sixty-five thousand to be safe. So, and and putting that in mind, when you mentioned the Fourth of July, of course, everybody calls it Cowboy and Cowgirl Christmas. Uh, in a matter of what fourteen days, how many rodeos? Uh, would that would, would the would the fifty thousand dollar bonus at, at Houston take some pressure off of having to try to make all of those rodeos in so many days? Oh, definitely. You know, you can look at Houston two ways. You can look at it as I, if I win Houston, I don't have to go as hard. Or if I win Houston, I have a chance to win a gold bottle. You know, it's it's kind of all in how hard you want to go and how you want to look at it. Yeah, and and Brittany, I mean, I'm just I'm just tickled and proud of your career. I mean, you look at going in and winning Rookie of the Year your first year in, and and uh, set a record that year as being the only rookie to ever go into the NFR in the leader spot. Uh, a, little, a little bit about your start in the barrel racing. I know that uh, uh, through high school, and especially in high school, you were on the golf team in high school? Oh, yeah. I um, I didn't grow up around horses at all. Uh, I didn't get my first horse until I was 11. Uh-huh. And uh, that's when I started riding. And then I probably didn't start running barrel until I was thir- probably 13 or 14. So, um, and in high school, and I was in, I was in big time into the gymnastics and uh, all that stuff. And my mom, my parents were like, you know, pretty much you're going to have to decide what do you want to do, horses or gym. And so I decided to do the horses. And then in high school, I did, I was on the golf team my freshman year, and it kind of took away from my horses. So I, you know, I just had to then pick again what I wanted to do. And um, horses have always been the, you know, the top pick. Well, the story is that even back at that young age, uh, your, your little sister, your mom and dad had got her a barrel pony. Uh, didn't work out too good for her, and you took it over. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, well, my parents kind of always, you know, my dad's big deal was, oh, you know, well, you only have one horse apiece. So um, her horse was getting older, and they we went about 30 miles down the road and um, bought a horse from some people that um, their daughter was going to college, and... She wanted to go to some pro rodeos, and he, they just didn't think he was going to be fast enough for the pro rodeos. So he had won quite a bit around where we lived, and so they bought him for my sister. Well, she uh, didn't go on too well with him. She had a, she rode him for about a year, and uh, then I had a more solid horse, and so we traded. And that ended up being the horse that I made the NFR on the first time, uh, Leroy. And, uh, you know, I rode him all through high school and stuff and college and uh i think he, i think he was 16 the year i made the finals on him uh-huh. well that's great you know is there and we're gonna have to wrap it up here because we're plain running out of time in the show and we do want to have you back sometime oh, but we, we got more to talk about i know i know that's what happens <laughs> but let me ask you is there we always like to ask a little off the wall questions is there something you enjoy beside riding do you do anything uh, for fun do you still play golf or anything um, I, well, I'm, I'm fixing to take a break in April and May, and I'm going to spend a lot of time at the beach. <laughs> Girl. <laughs> Girl. <laughs> a, a lot of time. <laughs> and I assume someplace nice and warm and cozy with, with fruity drinks. Sure, exactly. You're, you're <laughs> exactly right. I'm, I'm going to tell you what, Helena. She's got a pair of boots now. I mean, it's not cowboy boots and running boots, but uh, I saw her over at the casino in Kinder, Louisiana the other week, and she's got a pair of those high heel boots that, I mean, the black leather just signs you can almost see yourself in, and Helena might would like to borrow those boots from you sometime. <laughs> yes. I'm like sure totally thing. am with the cowgirl lifestyle. <laughs> I want to Well, you know, I mean, sometimes you just got to quit being a cowgirl for a little while. Yeah, now that beats <laughs> Sounds good, and and you have fun there, and and best of luck the rest of this year. We're rooting for you. Well, thank you, thank you. And we'll have you back after you uh, win again in uh, in, in the fall. Okay, sounds great. All right, thanks, Good Brittany. luck in Houston. Good luck in Houston. Okay. Thank you. Talk to you guys later. Bye bye. Right, you bet. Bye bye. Bye bye. Well, that was great. This has been a whole lot of fun. Alan, you don't know, Helene and I love doing what we do, and it, it's because we have the variety show. We get to do so many different things. We get to touch every part of the horse world, and it's all fascinating. Oh, yeah, every, every single bit of the equine. It's just like when we were talking earlier, uh, English, Western, uh, 
you know, there's no losers in this deal, whether it's a ribbon, whether it's money. Uh, my thought is that anybody that lays a brush on a horse, uh, saddles one up, pulls it up tight, and throws a leg over is a winner by, by taking care of one, of one of the most beautiful animals that God put on the face of the earth. Well, uh, we got to end the show with that, I think, Helena, don't we? I, yeah, no bloopers. <laughs> that was just, that was bad. That, that was great. Well, thank you very much, Alan. We really appreciate you being with us today. Will you come back sometime? Oh, you bet. Anytime. All right. And everybody, you can see our show notes at StableScoop.com. This was episode number 84. We've been doing this quite a while, Helena. And you'll find links to everybody's website, Alan's and and Brittany's and Jimmy K's. We'll have all their website links. So that's where you can find them. Go check them out. They have some great websites and their schedules on there. You can also find Alan's schedule right on there. Oh, yeah, I have uh, yep. a good deal on there. And that's alanmoorhead.com, A-L-A-N-M-O-O-R-H-E-A-D.com. And as I said, we'll have all the links at stablescoop.com. You can also find us on Facebook. Just look for Stable Scoop Radio Show, and you can follow us there. And you can find uh, us on Twitter as well, at Horse Radio, and Helena at... Helena underscore B-E-E. Well, cowgirl, it's been a great time this week. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> I like that you called me a cowgirl. <laughs> I'm going to go out and get me some western see, lessons. I want to see you in those tall black boots that you can see yourself in. No, with no, high heels. no, no. Please, I can barely walk in sneakers. <laughs> 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 well, until, nice. until we meet again. Oh, what are we doing next week? Next week? Next week is anybody's guess. Oh, yeah, who knows? <laughs> but so we'll be back again next week with... The Scoop. Thank you.